Well, we've had the treat over these last several days of listening to a conversation with my longtime friend, Barbara Rainey. She's been talking about, we've been talking about her new book. I'm highly recommending it. It's been a huge blessing already in my life. I told Robert as I was reading this book, honey, this book is going to make me an incredible wife. <laughs> and, um, you know, he already thinks I am an incredible wife, so, but I would, I want to be always growing and learning about how to better serve and bless him and how our marriage can better reflect the gospel of Christ. So I was eager to read this book. I've been loving this conversation with Barbara. It's called Letters to My Daughters, The Art of Being a Wife. And it is a treasure trove from cover to cover. It looks beautiful. It's beautiful to hold. It's beautiful to to look at, but it's even more beautiful to read and to ponder, to meditate on, to get these things into your heart. And we're offering it this week to our listeners who make a donation of any amount to the ministry of Revive Our Hearts. And uh, it's our way of saying thank you. Sending you this book is our way of saying thank you for your support of this ministry. So being with Barbara has been a treat. And today we're joined by her husband, Dennis Rainey. Dennis and Barbara, welcome to Revive Our Hearts. Nice. I've been in the hot seat a lot of times at Family Life, yeah. our sister parent ministry. And now today it's a joy to have you here on our turf at Revive Our Hearts. <laughs> I'm a minority in a sorority. What can I say? You sure are. You've got I a room am. full of women here. You and my husband sitting in the back row. Thank you, Robert, for showing back up. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been hearing Barbara's perspective on marriage. She writes uh, from her perspective. But one of the things you do so well, Barbara, in this book is to give us a perspective, not only through your own eyes, but through your husband's eyes as you've learned to know him, to understand him in these years. And so I thought it'd be great as we get to this particular topic today to be able to hear from you together as a couple. So here we go. You have a lot of different images in this book about marriage is like, it's uh -huh. like fine cuisine, it's like architecture, it's like photography. And then you come to a chapter that marriage is like a secret garden. That's right. And where are we going with that chapter? <laughs> Well, one of the, I'm going to tell you real quick the story about this chapter. Um, when I was thinking about an analogy for this chapter, I remembered a story that we used to read, um, my girls and I did. Uh, the boys weren't so much into this book, but the girls were into this book. And there was also a movie about it, mm -hmm. and the book was called The Secret Garden. It's a story about a little girl named Mary Lennox who was orphaned at nine years old, and she was sent back to live with an uncle in England. And when she got to his place in England, it was this grand, this grand house, almost like Downton Abbey, this great house with many, many rooms. And she began to explore this house, and she thought she was the only person in the house other than her uncle, and she soon discovered uh, after a while that she wasn't. But in the process of exploring the house and exploring the ground, she found a garden, but the garden had a big wall around it, and it was overgrown with weeds, and there was, as she dug around in it, day after day, she finally found a door. And then one day she found the key. And she took that key and she opened the door to that, that secret garden and walked in. And inside the garden was this, what was once a beautiful garden with pathways and, and beautiful plants that were now overgrown. The tree that was the centerpiece of the garden had broken limbs. There, were, there was trash lying all around. And she had this vision of what it could be again. And so this little nine-year-old girl, and then she made friends with another boy um, who was the son of the gardener. Together, the two of them set out to clean up that garden and make it beautiful again. And so the story of the book unfolds as these children transformed this secret garden that was broken down and in disrepair and brought it back to it, the glory of what it was once intended to be. And so I use that story as the introduction and as the theme for the chapter in which I talk about sex. Because sex is the secret garden of our marriages. It's the place where only two of us go. No one else goes there with us. It's meant to be behind the walls. It's meant to be closed with a lock and a key. And many of us entering marriage find our secret garden is much like the one that Mary Lennox discovered. It has broken places. There are a lot of limbs laying around. There are a lot of things that are damaged. And so it takes the work of two and the commitment of a marriage relationship to restore that secret garden to what God intended it to be in the first place. So that's the story of that chapter. 
And it's a word picture that actually has a basis in scripture. Right. We read in the Song of Solomon, this magnificent marriage story, story of love and romance and intimacy, where the bridegroom says to his bride, you are like a secret a garden, garden, a garden mm-hmm. shut up that's locked. And there, th- and that story is a story of how to get into each other's garden, how to, ex- how to get to know each other in the way that is most intimate so that they find together safety, healing, fruitfulness, blessing, mm-hmm. joy in a place that for so many people is a place of pain mm-hmm. and brokenness and frustration. Correct. So I love the way in this book that you uh, open up God's purposes and God's plan for something that for a lot of women and men is not a place of joy, but a place of pain. So as you think about, uh, as a couple, your journey in this area, um, talk about some of the challenges that you faced early on in marriage in coming to see physical intimacy from God's point of view. And I'm going to let I'm going to start with the husband. I want to hear from a man's perspective what we as women need to hear from and, and understand about our husbands. Well, the process in Genesis two is leave, cleave, and receive. The two shall become one. And the problem with the culture today is they're becoming one without the process of leaving and cleaving. Without um, not just a formality, but uh, changing loyalties from family to a spouse and then cleaving and making a commitment and I think the garden is a great illustration especially back to the story Barbara was telling because um, the, it, it's, it's the, the walls around the relationship that give the safety for two broken, broken people to explore and you're not going to do it perfectly but there's where the covenant of marriage and this is, this is where Barbara and I are just extremely passionate about this calling couples to to truly forge a covenant which means till death do us part. We're not going anywhere else. We're not going to leave. We're staying here and that means when it when it gets tough, when it's when it's not perfect, when it's not this Hollywood romance like we're led to believe it always will be and it and it's not. It's just it's just not that way in real life. You got dirty diapers and and kids and uh, interruptions and health issues and business uh, challenges, but it's the, it's the covenant of marriage that builds the wall so the couple can begin to explore the intimacies of marriage together and uh, be able to fail and yet get back up and uh, continue on in their relationship. And within that covenant, help us unpack why the physical oneness, physical intimacy is so important a part of that. I think God in His ingenuity, um, I don't think we have any idea what He's up to. When He calls two people away from having been in their families growing up to leave those families, declare a fresh new loyalty, and then to make a commitment and then begin the process of a lifetime of, of becoming one. Um, I think it's emotional, spiritual, it is physical. Uh, but I think it's a mirror of something that is far, even far greater, even in heaven. Now, you're speaking from the vantage point of 43 years of marriage and having worked through a lot of uh, challenges and hurdles. And uh, so this is seasoned married couple speaking to us today. But if you could take us back to your early years of marriage, you both, uh, you share pretty transparently in this book, Barbara, that you both brought fears and mm-hmm. baggage and failure into your marriage, how did that impact you when it comes to this whole thing of physical intimacy? <clears throat> well, I don't think our experience is that unusual, sadly, from the experience of so many today, because I think all of us mm-hmm. come into marriage damaged. Even if we weren't personally damaged or hurt in a relationship, a dating relationship or family relationship, we, we are all impacted by the damage of sin. So we all come with that. We all come with shame. But we also, most of us, come with some kind of of baggage, some kind of damage from past dating relationships or family relationships or just really, really wrong perspectives about what this is all about. And we were that way too. And so I think the early years of our marriage, so much of it was just understanding 
what we were each bringing to the relationship and how we were both so different, how we both approached it differently. And I had issues of trust, not being able to trust him. I did trust him, but it was not what it is today. And that had to grow. Trust is a, is a, is a capacity that grows in any marriage. Um, we think we really trust one another when we get married, but we find those places where it's hard to trust once we get in the marriage. And we have to explore, why is this hard to trust? What is, what is at the root of this, which requires more conversations? And we had lots of conversations. And we, you have to figure out what is it that is making trust a challenge for me or for him? And then how can we cover that? How can we um, heal that, that area so that then trust is allowed to grow? So we trust one another more than we did when we started. So trust is a commodity in marriage that isn't automatic. Um, and most of us come with some level of trust deficiency that has to be repaired so that trust can grow and become at the level that God wants it to be. And that takes many, many years. And that's why fidelity is so important, both just in your marriage to not have someone outside the marriage, but also like pornography today. Um, emotional infidelity breaks down that trust and makes uh, oneness uh, more challenging. And every marriage is either moving toward oneness or it's moving toward, uh, toward isolation. And I think it, it's, it really is upon the man to build, again, build those fences around the relationship that do allow trust to be established. And then if it, if it is broken, if they do fail, they, they confess that. There, there's one other dimension of this, Nancy, that um, occurred early in our marriage. Uh, it's just called real life. You know, we get married and we think it's going to be a honeymoon. We know it's not, theoretically. Uh, it's not going to be a long honeymoon forever and ever. Amen. But uh, uh, we get married and then we experience real life. And for us, there was a period of a year where, where we moved for the fifth time in six years. Uh, we, we had kids. We'd had two children. We'd been cheated out of money in a home we moved into. Um, we... Uh, we got the only short paychecks we've ever received in 46 years of being in ministry. Um, so we, we had financial challenges. Uh, then we had uh, my father died and uh, had to go back and care for my mom. All these things happened in a year. Uh, I had a son who had emergency surgery. And um, uh, then Barbara's heart took off racing and raced for over 300 beats a minute for over eight hours. So she was near death, and I was outside in the uh, coronary care area wondering what I was going to do as a single parent with two kids, under two, two and under. And, you know, when you go through a period of intense suffering, there isn't room for romance. And there's where, there's where the culture lies to us. Because a lot of life, as explained in this book, is going to be in the midst of storms. And it's why your house has to be built on mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and a commitment. Unless the Lord builds, builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And uh, I think this area of marriage gets idealized to the point of not, not, not even thinking through what's going to come at you as a couple in life. You say for better or for worse, but then what do you do when it happens? And I remember sitting in our living room listening to a praise song, just going, okay, God, there's no emotion. There, there is no romance. They're just a commitment to you and a commitment to Barbara. <coughs> and we're not quitting, but there's, there is no romance right now. And a lot of life is lived outside of that romantic ideal that Hollywood tells us exists all the time. And yet in the midst of real life, you talk in this book about how important it is to prioritize physical intimacy along with all these other areas that you're talking about. But you related back to those years when you had a lot of little children, mm -hmm. young marriage, and you're saying you were tired all the, all time. the time. And at times you said you needed, you felt a whole lot greater need for sleep That's than right. for <laughs> sex. And that physical intimacy often for you as a wife felt like it was at the bottom of your to-do list. And yet it was important not to put that off mm -hmm. until your children were grown. Right. Uh, so how do you... I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's a very unromantic um, 
concept to schedule being together intimately, but we did. I mean, we we just we had to talk about it and say, you know, we've got a plan for this because I knew that it was important to the health of our relationship to keep that aspect of our relationship alive. This is a little parenthesis. One of the radio guests we had a few years ago, and I, I mentioned this in the book, uh, came and talked about the chemical things that happen when a married couple has sex together. Those chemicals are released, and they, they increase the bonding between you as a man and a woman. And what that does is even if you don't have great sex, and a lot of times in marriage it's not great. A lot of times it's mediocre. It's a lot of times it's not even good. <laughs> but those chemicals are released, and I like that. I like that God has a benefit in, in our experiences that are less than stellar because we're all conditioned from Hollywood and the culture to think that it's going to be easy and it's always going to be fireworks. Well, it's not always going to be easy and it's not always going to be fireworks, but it is important to keep it alive. Why? Because we need that connection. We need that relationship. We need that bonding. And quite honestly, it is the bonding that oftentimes is the result. And so we would, we would hit seasons when we were not together very often, and we would look at each other, and we'd have these conversations, and we'd say, okay, we're going we're to have to figure this out. When can we be together? And we would literally, we didn't write it on the calendar, but we <laughs> put it on the mental calendar, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and, and here's the thing. It's, it's not wrong to schedule romance. Um, we'd put our kids to bed, and um, I would cook dinner, and Barbara would kind of take a little bit of the evening off, and prepare, I'd prepare the food, and then we'd actually have uh, a special meal in our, in our bedroom. And, you know, sometimes getting a babysitter and running around going to a restaurant is... It really kind of defeats romance. And so find a way to figure out how you meet, how you rendezvous, and then make it happen. And uh, it's why scheduling retreats to some kind of marriage retreat two or three times a year is not out of the question. Two or three nights away from the kids. Actually, we found that three nights away was, was, ideal. was ideal for us. Uh, I realize some people can't do that. But, well, and uh, it didn't always happen for us either. But, but you, have to, you have to be proactive about keeping your marriage healthy and growing and this is one of the areas that just you can't ignore it and so if you if you're intentional about keeping this area of your marriage alive and you're intentional about spending time as a couple then your relationship can continue to grow and thrive one of the challenges you talk about is how men and women view sexual intimacy differently how does that look different for a man than for a woman and and how do you help come to understand what this means mm -hmm. to your mate well, I write about that in one of the chapters, and I, you'll have to read it. And I'll say a few things, but it really is important to read it because it's, it was very hard for me as a woman, and I would suspect that this is true for all of you here today and those of you who are listening. It's hard for me as a woman to know what it's like to be a man. It's impossible to know what it's Correct. like to be a man. <laughs> and it's impossible for him to know what it's like to be a woman. Women view sex differently than men do. We have more of an emotional need than we do a physical need. That doesn't mean the physical need doesn't exist. It just means that the emotional need is greater in women than it is in men. In men, the need is more physical it, and that it is emotional. It doesn't mean it's not emotional. It just means that there's a, a difference between the two of us. And so coming to understand our needs, the basis for them, why we feel the way we feel again, takes lots of conversation and lots of interaction. And it also takes acceptance for the way God made us as different people. I, need, I came to learn to appreciate the way my husband was made, <clears throat> the way he was wired, the way God built him together as a man. And I had to give thanks for that and welcome it and appreciate it because God is in control and he's in charge and he's sovereign and none of this is a mistake. And if you conversely belittle that Correct. or disrespect it, what does that do to a husband? Well, it repels him, and it crushes him as a man. I mean, sex is very risky for a man. Uh, and I don't think women understand that yeah. either. It's, it's, it's a part of the way we're so different. Yeah. Uh, part of how I would explain it is Barbara's a magnet to me, and she is designed as a magnet to draw me from 
all over the places I go, either on a day, uh, daily basis to the office or from around the country or uh, to just come back home. And I'll never forget uh, back in the years when we had the weekend, remember, we couldn't afford to take our wives. Um, we were doing the conference, and on Saturday night I went to bed, and Barbara was home, and I called her on the phone to find out how she and the kids were doing. We talked for a while, and uh, I turned on a movie on TV, and uh, obviously had hung up from talking with her, and then uh, was watching the movie, and the phone rang. I'll never forget this. It was Kansas City. It was like 1981. We'd been married for less than 10 years at that point, and picked up the phone. It was a woman on the other end. She said, hi. What are you doing? And I, well, I'm, I'm watching a movie. Can I come up? She said. And I said, I don't think that'd be a good idea. She said, well, why? I said, well, I'm, I'm happily married. And at that moment, I really do remember thinking about, I'm married to a magnet and to someone I want to protect the trust that I have with her. And I'm, I've also got a family and it's a family built on trust. It's it's, it takes two to tango here, and we've got the tango going. And I want to keep it. I want to keep it going. And I said, the second reason that it wouldn't be a good idea for you to come up is the movie I'm watching is The Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> and I hung up the phone. That's a true story. But you know, you, you think about it, ladies. Your husband needs one magnet that draws him from all over. You are the only one, just as she is the only one, and was designed by God to be the only one, uh, to go into the secret garden with and to explore and to enjoy each other. And uh, I think Hollywood makes too much of sex. I think many times the religious community, Christian community, uh, is ashamed to talk about it. And... Uh, I love what Dr. Howard Hendricks said. You, you remember Prof? Mm -hmm. He said, we should not be ashamed to discuss that which God was not ashamed to create. Mm -hmm. And we need to be talking to our kids about this. So they've got more of a holistic, <clears throat> family-centered view of intimacy and marriage as well.